Hello everyone, I'm Ankita Bera. I'm a grad student at Tokyo University and this work has been done with Somali Sami and Kanan Dasta. So I'll start with this uh, picture of the evolution of our entire universe. Now starting from Big Bang to where we are, but after three days of conference, this picture doesn't need any introduction, but I'll just for completeness, I'll just briefly mention. So uh, I'm, I'm mostly interested in this period cosmic dawn because the, with the formation of these star stars and the galaxies at this period, the Lyman alpha photons from these star stars they, that couple the spin temperature to the gas kinetic temperature and that gives rise to these absorption profile, 21 centimeter absorption profile. And because of the presence of the luminous sources in the intergalactic medium, these absorption profiles start to rise and it goes to heating. And because of the uh, presence of the ionizing photons in the medium, this reionization continues till there are some neutral hydrogen present in the intergalactic medium. So, uh, but uh, this period, this period is mostly governed by different heating mechanisms present in the intergalactic medium. And it is uh, often assumed that the X rays from different sources actually heats the intergalactic medium and this gives rise to this heating profile. But in our case, in our study, we have considered uh, another heating mechanism, which is cosmic ray protons, which are coming from these fast stars. And we try to see the impact of these uh, cosmic ray protons uh, in the intergalactic medium or in turn the 21 centimeter signal. So for that, we modeled the uh, very early stars, uh, including the population C and the population 2 star. Now there are no consensus regarding the population C IMS. So we have considered a simplistic model where the population C stars are forming in the molecular field halo uh, below 10 to the power 4 Kelvin. And the maximum mass of these population C stars are governed by this molecular cooling cutoff, which is 10 to the power 4 Kelvin. And the minimum mass which is required to cool the gas and, uh, and form the star that is given by this uh, virial temperature of the, of the halo. Whereas uh, with the formation of these fast stars along with the Lyman alpha photons, the Lyman Warner photons also get generated and that acts as a negative feedback to the star formation. And because of that, because of the presence of the Lyman Warner flux, the minimum mass changes which I will show in the next slide how it gets changes. And for POP2 star formation, when the halo crosses the virial temperature of 10 to the power 4 Kelvin, the POP2 star starts to form. And we have taken the supernova regulated star formation, which is coming from, it, it, we have taken this uh, star formation model from Sami et al. 2014. And with this, we get this minimum mass. We plot in the left hand side, we plot the uh, minimum and the maximum mass required for the population C star formation. And for maximum mass, the black dot, black dashed one is the molecular cooling cutoff corresponding to the molecular cooling cutoff temperature. And the green dotted one is the minimum mass coming from the virial temperature and it gets modified because of the. Okay. And um, this minimum mass gets modified if we consider the uh, presence of the Lyman Warner photon, and that is given by these uh, red stars. So, uh, with this, we get the total star formation the population C and the population 2 star formation. Uh, we calculate from our model, and we see that at redshift around uh, 17. The, there is a coexistence of the population C and the population 2 stars. And after that, the because of the Lyman Warner photons, the population 3 stars uh, dilutes and the POP2 starts, uh, these starts to dominate at low redshift. So then uh, from these uh, very, uh, very early stars, which are ending their lives as the PR instability supernova, they inject cosmic ray protons in the intergalactic medium. And we calculate that from these uh, injected spectra. And along with the injected cosmic ray particles, we take into account the evolved cosmic ray protons, which are coming from the previous, the, the early redshift as well. And as these particles propagate 
to the IGM to the start forming region, their velocity or their energy gets modified because of the collision with the free electron, the ionization with the neutral hydrogen and because of the adiabatic expansion of the universe. So, uh, then we uh, we calculate these impact of these cosmic ray protons on the gas temperature, spin temperature and the corresponding brightness temperature. And in our model we have different parameters, u is the spectral index of the cosmic ray spectra, epsilon c is the efficiency of the cosmic rays coming from the pop 3 star and the epsilon 2 is the efficiency of the cosmic rays coming from the pop 2 star. And we vary these parameters to check the dependency of these uh, parameters on the, on the input of these uh, heating of the intergalactic medium. And we find that and here we have not considered any other heating mechanisms like X-ray or any other heating mechanism, only cosmic ray heating is present here and here we can see that this cosmic ray is can provide a lot of heating, a significant heating to the intergalactic medium. Now to, uh, to check with the observations, we have considered these edges observation. Now uh, the, there are lots of discussions and debates regarding these observation because the absorption depth of these uh, profile is almost two times larger than the strongest prediction and it requires uh, the, some exotic physics like the interaction between the dark matter and barium or the presence of the radio background. So, in our case, we have considered the to explain these excess absorption depth, we have considered the interaction between the dark matter and barium. And when we consider the dark matter barium interaction and we turn on these uh, cosmic ray heating, then and when we plot it with the edges profile, we can see that these cosmic ray heating can actually provide uh, significant heating or it can explain the sharp rise of the edges profile. And then uh, this part of this profile is governed by the Lyman alpha, mostly governed by the Lyman alpha photon. So, depending on the further uh, observation, we can actually constrain the contribution of the pop 3 stars because uh, for this green curve, here we have taken a lot of contribution from the pop 3 stars and we can see that if the absorption depth is not high, it is shallow, then we, we do not require the contribution from the pop 3 stars a lot. So, uh, so the main takeaway from this work is the cosmic ray par particles or the cosmic ray protons could be a potential source of heating during cosmic dawn and reionization, which needs to be considered uh, for the complete reionization modeling. So, with this, I will actually move to this next uh, work, which is which I recently did with these people, and it is done at Saturn Institute, USA. So, and this work is. I think much more uh, appropriate for today's uh, theme of this workshop. So, in this work, what we did uh, with the cosmic dawn constraint, which is a, which is taken from the edges, we have considered some other observations from reionization and the post reionization, and we try to infer the conditions which are required to bridge the gap between these uh, different observational constraints. So, for that, this is our first observational constraint from cosmic dawn and what we have taken like uh, as I mentioned, the Lyman alpha photon that is required to couple the spin temperature to the gas kinetic temperature and Madao, one of his work has shown that the, these Lyman alpha photons or the Uthusen field uh, coupling that is required to uh, couple the spin temperature to the gas kinetic temperature at this redshift inferred from edges is uh, consistent with the linear extrapolation of these HST observations, low redshift HST observations. So, we have taken these uh, extrapolated UV luminosity density for this redshift 5 to 20 as our observational constraint uh, which are coming from cosmic dawn. And then uh, along with that, we have taken these reionization history measurements and we have lots of measurements, but all most of them are below redshift 8, which is around uh, reionization period. And this is the uh, globally average neutral hydrogen fraction. And then along with that, we have taken the optical depth measurements uh, and these red dashed line 
provides the mark value of the optical wave value, Bragg optical wave value. And then along with that, we have taken these ionizing emissivity the measurements, which is below redshift 5, which is that means uh, it is at post deionization epoch. So now we have all these measurements at cosmic dawn deionization and the post deionization epoch. So then uh, we considered these source model, these physically motivated source model, which is derived from these radiative transfer simulation. And this is a generalized form because the, here the ionizing emissivity depends on the halo mass. And this function has a Schechter like uh, Schechter like function where this function has a um, on one, one side it has the power law cutoff and on another side it has the exponential cutoff which should be clear from these plots. Now here we fix C. Now we have different uh, parameters in our source model G, C, F, S, P, and etc. So if we fix C and if we only vary G, B parameter here then we can see these B parameter actually acts as the minimum halo mass uh, that is required for these ionizing emissivity that it serves as the minimum halo mass. But the most interesting parameter is the C because if we fix B and only vary C then for C equal to 0 the relation between the ionizing emissivity and the halo mass is linear and when C is positive then the then most of the contribution to the ionizing emissivity is coming from the high mass halo whereas if C is negative then the ionization is mostly governed by the low mass field or the faint galaxy. So with this, we have now we have this model and all the observational constraints. And as uh, all the observational constraints are the globally average quantities, so we have taken the semi-analytical approach instead of numerical simulation because of these uh, limitations in the subgrid physics and the box size and resolution. So uh, we converted these ionizing emissivity to the star formation rate by taking into account the metallicity and uh, Schett-Torman halo mass function and then converted the star formation rate to the UV luminosity density using the Kanigat relay. And then we have taken these uh, observational constraint the extrapolated UV luminosity density at first and we tried to infer these parameters B and C. So here are the, is the distribution, the posterior distribution of these parameter B and C. Now for B and, and we did this analysis for three redshift ranges, one for the cosmic dawn greater than 16, one for less than 10 and another one is from redshift 5 to 20. And from these distributions we can see that this B value has a tendency to take between 10 to the power 6 to 10 to the power 8 solar mass. And uh, this is quite similar to what is found in the numerical simulation as well. So, so we have fixed these B parameter to this value 7.6 because from simulation we get it's 10 to the power 8. So to break the degeneracy between the parameters we fix this value in our further analysis. But the uh, if we look at the distribution of C then we can see for these cosmic dawn period C has a tendency to go more uh, negative and negative side which uh, gives us this conclusion that the that uh, to include the high redshift measurements or the cosmic dawn measurements we require a lot of contribution from these uh, from the low mass halos of the faint galaxies. So we did the Bayesian analysis of the MCMC here and after that uh, we with these inferred parameters for the sanity check with these inferred parameters we plotted uh, the, the UV luminosity with the Medow extrapolated data. And we find that for all the uh, all the models, it actually within the one sigma level. So then we considered in our likelihood only consider the reionization and the post reionization measurements. And when we consider only the reionization and the post reionization measurements, we get these blue uh, distribution. And when uh, on top of that, we consider these uh, UV luminosity, which is inferred from edges, these. Uh, high redshift of the cosmic dawn measurement, we can see there is a diagonal shift in the contour, which uh, validates the point that for high redshift measurements, we require a lot of contribution from the faint galaxies and the photon ionizing or the ionizing uh, photons needs to be escaped at a much higher rate, which we get from here. 
So then we have these two models, one we call as UR and another we call as CD plus UR. So then we compare our models with their with the CSUN simulation because um, it's a it's a it's a radiation hydrodynamic simulation which evolves the ionization at large scales and it considers most of the ionizing sources uh, based on the elasticity HD model. And in uh, Thesan High, uh, this model uh, here the ionizing emissivity is mostly driven by the high mass halos or the halos greater than 10 to the power 10 solar mass. And for Thesan High, uh, sorry, and for Thesan Low, the most of the contribution is coming from less than 10 to the power 10 solar mass. So that's why we compared our models with their models as well. And we find a similar kind of turnover here for these two models. And this is because the for the uh, UR model, we require a lot of contribution from the massive halos. And as the massive halos are not much abundant or not present during this high redshift, so the total ionization rate is low for this UR model. But then it uh, starts to increase because of the presence of the massive halos at uh, low redshift. And for the CDUR model, we get a much flatter evolution in the ionizing MCD. And then we also compared with the uh, observation as well, and it fits with the observation. And because of these different ionizing emissivity uh, evolution, we get very different reionization history. So, for uh, UR model, we get late reionization and much steeper reionization, whereas for CDUR model, we get uh, early reionization and the, and it's more gradual. Uh, but for both the models, it actually uh, fits with these low redshift uh, measurements of the neutral hydrogen fraction. And because of the the early reionization here in this model, we get uh, very, a high a very high optical depth uh, in this model. But for both these models. Uh, the the inferred optical depth value or the evolution of, of the optical depth value it's within the one sigma level of the plan 2018. So now we have these two models which uh, fits with the observations, but based on the fact that we we if we get much more information on the faint end of the luminosity function from the JWST, we'll be able to constrain one of our models based on the fact that we require early reionization or the late reionization. So, yes, this is some inside. Questions? Yes, so uh, for the uh, contours you are showing for the two cases, URCD plus uh, Lia, yes. Uh, so, it seems that in the red one, the the ionization and the cosmic down both the things exist and for the blue one there is no cosmic down effect and only the ionization. Yes, for UR we have taken the measurements from neutral hydrogen fraction, the ionizing emissivity and the optical depth mm -hmm. and for the CD plus UR along with this we have taken this extrapolated UV luminosity density which is inferred from HS. Okay, so I was wondering why this blue contours are being discarded uh, if you I mean, that there should be some portion of blue contours which should overlap with the red ones if you do not ideally include the cosmic done. Uh, for, yeah, I mean, this is what we are, we got. Like, for UR, we got very low, like, uh, we get the photon escape fraction 2%. Okay. And for CDUR, we get this uh, photon escape fraction around 30%, more than 30%. So that's why there isn't any overlap and it's it has a actually more tendency to go more lower side and we haven't taken the log FSTF that's why it, there is a cut here uh, this uh, zero but it has a tendency to go more lower yeah. side. It seems that cosmic down is effect affecting a lot. Dramatically, yeah. yeah. So that's why we have taken only one measurement in the cosmic down and it's it's shifting the, the yes. entire contour a lot. And another question I had uh, you are also including the post reionization measurement or something like that? Yes, post reionization for post reionization, I am mainly considering these ionizing emissivity because that is below redshift 
4.75 how much does it affect uh, i mean just so the main contribution we got is from xh1 the neutral hydrogen fraction is actually driving the entire uh, evolution that we take okay even from the post pnas neither that yeah 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 right. when we considered when we consider these entire uh, thing and we actually uh, check for neutral hydrogen and the ionizing emissivity and the optical depth separately and then when we combine we have seen that the main contribution is coming from these neutral hydrogen fraction even for the for redshift up to 4 okay oh, thank you yeah so a uh, very nice both mm-hmm. ideas are path breaking so it will be nice to see where this leads in the next few years with uh, further work uh, but i think this is these are the right projects to do uh, so i have many questions <laughs> just a couple uh, for now uh, for the cosmic uh, ray thing uh, uh, the heating is really amazing uh, it's a very uh, heating rate is much larger than i would have naively thought so uh, have you in also included here the heating from cosmic rays from type 2 and type 1 supernovae from pop 2 stars apart from your pair instability there are also presumably normal supernovas in the model have you yes yeah, so we haven't considered separately the type 1 type 2 supernova we mostly considered the fractional uh, energy that is uh, getting like uh, how much uh, energy that these cosmic ray particles are getting from these supernovas and from these cos- how much cosmic ray energy is getting to the intergalactic medium but for this uh, no so the supernova number density is that only tracking population 3 star formation or is it tracking also the population 2 population 2 star formation as well okay, and we nice. have seen that if we only take the population 3 uh. then then the heating is not that efficient so we have to take into account pop 2 otherwise uh, we cannot explain i see okay size. okay but then if that is the case then uh, this uh, heating sh- should uh, also be significant today in today's universe and so in that case there should it should be possible to understand this from lyman alpha forest at lower redshifts mm-hmm. so have yeah. you or someone else thought about this and uh, no, i don't but we, but yes it's it's actually a very good point we haven't thought about that ah, so there is very forest. mature technology to uh, yes, constrain that if uh, if uh, that seems uh, not to have been looked into mm-hmm. thank you to comment to your question i think somodi uh, they have done some work on uh, effect of cosmic rays uh, in the post tnsn era at uh, 2000 uh, 2014 2005 i think to, okay yeah, yeah so but so they, they i think they claim they also claim that that cosmic rays can also be potential source even during post ionization yeah that's what i yeah, I, yeah. but i think that is not considering the lyman uh, lyman alpha what lyman alpha is not that imp- I, i don't know it, it's not that lyman alpha is important during cosmic dawn because it helps to couple the spin temperature to igm temperature right and it so uh, so igm temperature so spin temperature can couple with this uh, igm temperature mm-hmm. okay. and um, regarding your uh, uh, cosmic ray emission from uh, pop 3 stars and pop 2 stars i think uh, what happens that for, in our calculation for pop 3 kind of stars we assume that those kind of stars are uh, hosted in mini halos and uh, so and uh, small mass halos and once once there is a supernova the entire uh, so 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 the cosmic rays from that supernova can escape easily because it's a small halo so they can escape so their effect is uh, small small energy cosmic rays are affecting the heating uh, for atomic cooling halo the massive halo uh, small energy cosmic ray photons cannot escape they are remain confined within uh, galaxy but high energy can escape easily so the heating mechanism from pop 3 uh, super cosmic rays and pop 2 cosmic rays are kind of different in nature yeah, yeah and, and most of the high energy protons are escaping from the pop 2 that's why the contribution to the heating is mostly governed by the uh, pop the cosmic rays coming from pop 2 because the high energy protons are there one last quick question so how do you uh, calculate the errors on the rho uv 
when you can when you take into account it is uh, observation yeah. so yeah so they have a relation where they take into account uh, these sigma and the measurement so they have a relation empirical relation and so we have taken that empirical relation which takes into account the error and the measurement okay. i mean i can show you the letter maybe, maybe we can discuss yeah yeah, yeah. okay no, but they take into account these errors we can move to the next talk uh, we are running late <laughs> okay uh,